me, would you please, in the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 5. We will move into Joshua chapter 6, perhaps this evening or even next Sunday when we see that Joshua will lead the people of Israel to come up against Jericho, that mighty city, the first city that they would encounter as they've entered into the promised land. But today we consider Joshua chapter 5 and some things that were required in their lives in preparation for victory. In preparation for victory. And I hope today to be a help to you. There are some, some topics here that could be a little bit complicated to explain. We'll do our best with those, but I think the principles are easy to see. And I believe that the Lord would have us here, and I hope that this will be a help to you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, please, and then we'll begin. Father in heaven, again, we come to your word desiring to hear from you and to learn of you. Lord, it is my sincere desire for your people that we would go forward in this life that we have in Christ and that we would experience to the fullest the fruitfulness, Lord, the satisfaction that comes in a life that's lived for the Lord Jesus. We recognize that you are our captain and we follow your lead and we desire today to understand in a greater way the victory that we have in you. We're thankful today, Lord, for our salvation and now, Lord, we desire just as in faith we received you that we would learn to walk in faith in our service to you. Use now this example of the children of Israel and J Joshua and this time that he was with them and the directives that you have. Use them in our lives as well. And we'll certainly give you the thanks for it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. How many of you have already tapped into the Christmas cookies? Christmas chocolate? All of the above. I can tell you're sleepy today. Turn up the air conditioning, cool them off, all right? That's what usually works, all right? It's a, it's a great time of the year, but boy, this is a busy time of the year. Lots of things going on, programs to be involved with, I get it, family gatherings, and that's great, and I hope you'll have a good time. I hope you have a good testimony over these next few weeks with your loved ones as you have opportunity to witness, take some gospel tracts with you and leave them laying around and get them passed out. Let's do our part to show people the Lord Jesus Christ and the priority in our life for Christ. We're looking here in the book of Joshua. As we mentioned in our opening comments, we know from what we've studied thus far that Moses, the leader that God used to bring Israel out of Egypt in such a fantastic fashion, Moses, whom was the one that would go in and be the spokesperson of God to Pharaoh and then to the people of God, Moses has now died. It was time that generation that had been judged that they would die in the wilderness, those that were 20 and upward, they've died off now. Moses has been taken. Moses was still in full strength, but it was time for Moses to go on so that the people of God could go forward. And this is exactly what we've seen. We've watched the call of Joshua. In Joshua chapter 1, we've seen the promise of God to Joshua regarding his, uh, the word of God and God being with him. And then we saw last week, and we considered in detail the crossing of the children of Israel over the Jordan River. There are two water crossings for Israel. The first was the Red Sea. The Red Sea was parted by God. You'll remember Moses stood there with the Egyptians pressing hard upon them. Moses stood there and said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And God caused the Red Sea to be parted. And all the people walked over on dry ground. Not only did God deliver them, but then you remember that the Pharaoh and his army pursued them. And God brought upon their head the Red Sea and destroyed them there. So in that crossing, God not only delivered them out of bondage, but God also delivered them from their enemy. What a tremendous type of salvation. Because this is what the Lord Jesus has done for us with the blood that was applied. And then we watched as that generation, that first generation, would move out and they would stand on the entrance way to the promised land. And we know the mistake that was made. They sent spies in and the spies came back and they gave a contradictory report to what God had commanded them to do. Twelve men went to spy in Canaan. Ten were bad and two were good. And the ten swayed the people and the people out of fear rebelled against God and did not enter in. Because of that, God judged that generation and he said, you will wander for 40 years in this wilderness until this generation passes away, save two men, Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb of the men of that generation were able to continue on. And now it's that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant and the minister of Moses, 
who now is called the lead. They've crossed the Jordan. We looked at that last week. We considered the ark of God, and we talked about that in detail. We watched as the priests carried the ark of God for that work of God to be accomplished. They stepped down in the waters of Jordan at a time when Jordan was flooding, seemingly not the natural time for God to bring his people across. But our God defies the natural. Aren't you thankful today that that's your God? The same God of Moses and Joshua is your God as well. And so they stepped in and God parted it. We even saw the details. God t describing the cities where the water was held back to. And this mighty group of people, some projected to be a million, two million. Some even say as many as three million people will cross over. In the midst of crossing over, one man from every tribe was directed to take a stone, a stone that was so large it would have to be carried on his shoulder. And so while the priests were holding the ark, the people of God would cross over. Those stones were brought out and they were set on the other side of Jordan to be a memorial, an Ebenezer of what God had done. So that when generations would come and children would ask, what mean these stones? What's the purpose of these? That one generation could tell another generation what God had had done for them. In the midst of that, Joshua himself took 12 stones and set them up in the middle of the Jordan River as a personal memorial. And we touched on those things last Sunday evening. All the people now have crossed clean over. In Joshua chapter 5, we see these things about the kings in the land that they had come to. You'll remember we brought this out, I believe, in the study of Elijah, that there was a time God was looking upon that land the promised land. There were inhabitants in that land. And it said that there, the time was not complete, that their fullness, the fullness of the Amorites had not taken place. These were a people who had rejected God. These were a people who had worshipped idols. These were a people who had mistreated the people of God. And God was now bringing judgment upon them in the form of Israel coming through. And so remember that. The time is now. The time is right. And the Bible tells us that the people in that land, uh, for example, Rahab the harlot, who we touched on last week very briefly, she had heard the testimony of Israel coming out of Egypt. She had heard how God had parted the Red Sea 40 years before, and from that she feared God. And she became a person who was a person of faith and became a part of Israel and would even become a part of the household and the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. Rahab and her family spared by her faith. Now they've crossed the Jordan, and the Bible tells us in verse 1 that the kings, look at this with me again, would you please, Joshua chapter 5 and verse 1, the kings of the Amorites and the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until we were passed over. Notice this expression, that their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them anymore. Seemingly, they felt like there would be a protective barrier with the Jordan River. Seasonally, it had flooded. Certainly, in their mind, they had thought, we'll have some time to prepare for these people coming in. Perhaps they would form alliances together, as we'll see is the pattern in the Scripture for them to fight against Israel. But unbeknownst and shockingly to them, God worked in a tremendous way, and it took the Spirit out of them. It caused their hearts to melt. They were nervous. They were stirred up. To you and I, it would seem that this is the time to pounce. To you and I, this would seem as if God has prepared the way now and the people of God should march right on to Jericho. They come to the plain of Jericho. Jericho is in sight. But before they go any further in their conquest of this land, God does business with them. I want to speak to you again and remind you that the crossing of the Jordan and the promised land, I believe, is a picture or a type of the life that the Lord would have us to live in Christ. It is that life of being fruitful. It is the life of being victorious. It is the life of experience in our homes and in our relationships and our ministry, everything that God would have for us. It is comfort in suffering. It is joy in crisis. It is fullness of joy. It is everything that I believe the Lord would have for His people to know and experience in this life. I'm glad that I'm saved. This morning, if you're not saved, I want you to know what that means. I want you to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. There's both, no better news that one man can share with another than that Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. So let somebody know that Jesus came to save sinners. And this morning, if you do not know for sure that your sins have been forgiven, 
If you do not know that your name is recorded in heaven, if you do not know today that you have right standing with God, then there's nothing more important than for you to hear this. Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus rose again to give you life, an everlasting life. And as that man who cried out in the scripture, what must I do to be saved? That should be our heart's cry today when we consider who God is. When we recognize the judgment that's passed upon us because of our sins. We cry out, what must I do? Is there a mountain I must scale? Is there a kingdom I must conquer? Is there a gift that I must bring? Is there a sacrament that I must take? Is there a baptism that I must have administered to me? What is it that I've got to do? What church do I have to join? What works do I have to complete in order to be saved? There's none of those things. It is for you and I to humble ourselves and by faith believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that verse comes in a book that gives tremendous explanation and detail that all men are sinners regardless of race or creed or background. All men are in the same condition for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have all have a sentence passed upon us, the death sentence that's passed upon us because of sin. And there's only one who can break that. There's only one who can give us life, and that's Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and you've never received him, well, I want to encourage you today to let somebody here help you. Let some man or some lady, perhaps somebody sitting near to you at the time of invitation today, let's get that settled. Let's leave this place today knowing the gospel and what the gospel is and how it relates to me. But then we look here after the parting of the Red Sea, we see salvation. But now I want to encourage you that the Lord didn't just bring Israel out of Egypt for them to wander. He brought them out of Egypt so that they could prosper, so that they could be successful. And I'm not using the world's terms now, I'm using God's terms. You see, prosperity and success for Israel was to step into the land that God had for them, where they would be able to serve Him wholly without the influence, without the negative, and without the being drawn back that they had experienced all those years, that they would be able to establish that tabernacle that they had been carrying around, that it would be established, that the presence of God would dwell with them, that they would go in and they would possess the land that they would eat from that land, that they would grow and they would take stake and have stake in that land that God had for them. That the former life of bondage and servitude would be rolled away and now they would stand firmly in the, on the ground and in the place that God had for them. We desire today, or we should for each other, these things. We desire these for our young people, that they would not only know the Lord, but that they would know that fruitfulness, that Psalm 1 speaks of, that speaks of success and being a tree that's planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. We desire that from the time we're saved until the time we're called home, that our life and the pattern of our life would reflect our Lord Jesus Christ. And that in our testimony there would be the evidence of his mighty work in our lives through our attitudes, through our responses, through our appetites, through our purposes. The Apostle Paul, who was a religious man and zealous at that, he said that everything that he knew and that he had learned before Christ, he counted but loss, he counted but dung. They meant nothing. That what he wanted his life to be marked by was the experience and the knowledge of Christ and the power of Christ resting upon his life. This is promised land living. God's part of the Jordan God's brought them across where you and I would say it's time to sharpen our swords it's time to prepare for battle the Lord Jesus tells Joshua to prepare knives you see for Israel there was a covenant that God had entered into with them through their father Abraham in Genesis chapter 17 a token of that covenant was the circumcision of the male people it was even for the Lord Jesus that eight days after his birth, he was presented for circumcision. It was a token. This is not the only token in the Bible. There are others. For example, when God flooded the earth, he gave to Noah and to us the token that he would never flood the earth again. He gave the token of the rainbow. He gave to Moses later on uh, the, in the law the token of the Sabbath, of a day of rest, of resting in the Lord. 
He would give to the New Testament believers, in a sense, the token, an expression, an outward expression of an inward condition when he gave us the ordinance of baptism. Baptism does not save us. Baptism expresses and it gives a visual picture of what Christ has done for us. We've been buried into Christ and just as Christ died on the cross and just as Christ was buried, we've been risen again now. We've risen with Christ to walk in newness of life. It's an expression, it's a picture of what we have in Christ. And for Israel, he did something. He instituted this matter of the circumcision. But the Bible tells us in great detail that this generation that was now entering in they had not been performed in this covenant commitment, this thing of circumcision. Before they could go forward, there needed to be a cutting away. There needed to be a consideration and a recognition of their relationship to the Lord. It speaks to us today, just as it did to them in Deuteronomy 10 and Deuteronomy 30. The Lord even gave them insight into the purposes of this outward expression that it was to be a picture of what their heart was like, that their heart was dedicated to the Lord. In a very careful manner, in a place that spoke of life and spoke of generations, uh, God wanted there to be a token. God wanted there to be an understanding amongst them of their need to not be governed and to be directed by the flesh, but rather to be cut away from that and to follow God and to follow His ordinances. And so where you and I would have said, hey, prepare your swords. God says, prepare your hearts. Prepare your hearts. So oftentimes as the people of God, we look ahead and we see what God wants for us. We understand what God wants for our homes, for example. We recognize that God desires in our marriages that there be love and that there be submission and that there be consideration and that there be fruitfulness there in our communication and our relationships with each other. We desire those things. That's maybe what we're looking to in the new year of what we would desire to see the Lord do. But may I say to you, before we come up against Jericho, before we march the walls of Jericho, could I ask you this morning, what needs to be consecrated in your life? What needs to be cut out? What thoughts... What appetites, what passions need to be removed? This business of circumcision speaks to the believer today of consecration. It is much like what we see in Romans chapter 12, which I often quote to you. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It speaks the same as those letters that were written to the church in Ephesus when they were told and reminded of who they had been and now who they are in Christ. And they were told to put off the old man. I was a junior high boy. I received the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. I recognized my need for Him. I got it. It was clear to me. Jesus came. Jesus died. Jesus rose again for me. And I received Him as my Savior. My name was written in heaven. My sins were forgiven. No longer could the Lord now or would the Lord impute iniquity against me. But as I began to learn of God, as I began to learn of the Lord Jesus Christ and who He is, I recognized that in my life there was a need for consecration. There was a need for removal of the flesh and the acts of the flesh. The book of Ephesians and then even further on we'll see that there are works of the flesh. Wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking. These are things that are to be put away from us because this is not who we are. That's the flesh. That's the appetites and the attitudes and the learned behaviors of the flesh. But there comes that time if we're going to go forward and have victories and conquest. We must allow the Lord to do that search in our heart. And cut things away. The Bible says that the word of God is quick and powerful than any two-edged sword. So oftentimes we're quick to take the sword and use it on others. But hesitant to allow the word of God to be the scapel that it is. To open up and to divide asunder the thoughts and the intents of the heart. I'm quick to draw my sword and tell you everything that's wrong in the world. And everything that's wrong with this crowd and that crowd. But how often do the people of God allow the word of God to do surgery in their heart? And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. That passage comes on the heels of what? Grieving or 
stymieing or hindering the work of God in our lives. You see, if I'm to go forward in this new year and experience all the victories and the fruitfulness that the Lord would have for me, I believe we must do an honest inspection of our hearts. In my heart, I find such things as mentioned in passing, but I find such things as my passions. Sometimes in my heart, I make it more about me than I should. Sometimes in my heart, I make it more about what I want than I should. God told Israel through that process of circumcision that he wanted something to be evidenced. And that was that they wanted to serve God and live for God with their whole heart. It's much, much easier to go forward for the Lord when we love him as we should. It's much, much easier to be obedient to the Lord when he has his right place in that matter. What? do you hold on to today what do you keep back today we would say this is seemingly not the best strategy the Bible tells us then after this situation of this taking place which by the way had not taken place should have but had not and all this time they were in the way why not the Bible doesn't give an explanation as to why it had not happened it was an ordinance it was a directive it was something that had been spoken to them originally to Abram and then passed on why had they not? Was it because of discouragement? Was it because of frustration? Was that a generation that wandered and continually had burials? A generation that every day woke up to be fed by God manna? A generation that had missed out on the fruits? Had missed out on the grain of the promised land? Had they in difficult days, had they in wandering moments just simply let things go? I find that to be the case in carnal Christians. All of a sudden, the issues that really matter and the issues that really cut us at our heart, we just kind of let them drop. We, begin, we can be discouraged. We can be frustrated. Let me, for a moment, make application. Sometimes we look at our lives and through our decisions, we have frustrations, we have setbacks. Sometimes we look at our lives and we say, this is not as I envisioned it to be. Sometimes our hopes, our desires did not come to pass. Sometimes because of sin in our life, we have consequence. And maybe today you would walk through life and you would say, preacher, God is good and God is merciful and God is long-suffering. But I recognize in my life some areas and some things in my life that could have been that aren't. This was that generation was it out of frustration? Was it out of disappointment that they did not prepare the next generation for what lay ahead? Oh, listen, may we today fully embrace God, His love, His mercy, and His long-suffering. May we allow the Lord today to reignite in each of our hearts a passion for where we're at and what He has for us. May we put behind us, and may we leave behind us, as the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Lord, said that he pressed towards the mark for getting those things that were of the past. I think there was a generation that spent 40 years remembering their bad decision and the consequence of it. Today we have in Christ hope and we have life. There are people today, your testimony is silenced in a sense. You like that candle that's been lit but it's been covered up. Maybe because of defeat. Maybe because of discouragement. Could we today agree to let the past be the past and let the future that the Lord has for us and the mark that he has for our life, can we let the Lord work with us and take us where we're at and from where we're at? And can we help this next generation to be grounded and to be established in God's purposes and God's directive? Do you understand that this generation that's coming in, these were people who had been children in Egypt? They, there were those who had been around during the Passover. It's not so far removed. It was the adults, 20 and up. The scripture gives us clarification on that, that it passed off. These were young people who had been there for Passover. These were young people who had seen the Red Sea parted. There was a generation here, a younger generation, that now have grown up. There were those who were 10. There were those who were teens. They're now 50 years of age and maybe older than that. Now they've gone with that crowd and they've watched all that happen. Don't you know how excited they must have been for this new endeavor? Remember we said from day one, right? New day, same God, same purpose. 
but a new day. There is a matter, number one, for consecration, to be set apart. Can I ask you today, I mentioned a moment ago I was saved as a teenager, and as I grew in my understanding of the Lord, I recognized in a greater way that if I were to serve Him effectively, if I were to see in my life all that He would accomplish, then there would need to be those things that were cut away. Somewhat like the potter working the clay on the wheel, removing those things that were there. And you hath He quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. We were, but we're not now. We could go on and on. Colossians 3, 7 through 10, in the which you also walked sometime when you lived in them, but now you also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. There is a need in our life if we are going to go forward for consecration, to allow the Holy Spirit to cut away and to show us and to deal with us. Do you carry in your heart bitterness? Do you carry in your luggage of life or your baggage of life frustration or anger are you still dealing with past hurts do they continually hinder you and draw you back do you deal with lust do you deal with pride or allow the lord to do surgery and to cut away those things of the flesh that would hinder and keep us from going forward i want you to notice the second thing this morning if you would please in joshua chapter 5 after that matter of consecration look with me verse 9 and the lord said unto joshua This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore, the name of this place is called Gilgal unto this day. The name Gilgal speaks of a rolling away. God said that he did something for Israel here at Gilgal. Look at it with me. He rolled away the reproach of Egypt. What is this speaking to? Perhaps two applications. One, there seems to be in the book of Exodus and then in Numbers a spirit of the people who were observing Israel coming out and not going in. It seems to me that there was a level of reproach in their disobedience to what God had for them. God was taking that spirit or that attitude or that uh, thought process of reproach for being disobedient. God was removing that. Or simply the reproach of Egypt was that they had been in bondage and now God wanted them to know they were no longer enslaved. They were no longer in bondage, but they were now His people living in His land ready to go forward. To that end, I would say this to you. Aren't you thankful today for a God who rolled away our reproach? Aren't you thankful today that we are in a place and in a position in Christ that we too can go forward, that we too can serve Him? When I consider the testimony of Saul, he who persecuted the church, I recognize how the Lord rolled the reproach away from his life. When I look in the lives of others, a man by the name of Zacchaeus, a man whose name brought reproach and was spoken of and considered in such a way. But when he met the Lord, the Lord did something. He rolled away his reproach. And I want for you and for our lives and for our testimonies that it would be the same, that the reproach is rolled away and that there is now a name of a name that has a testimony for being that and the people here, of being the people that God uses and the people that God blesses. Notice with me, would you please, in verse 10, and the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the what? The Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. The Passover was that feast that God had directed the people to begin things with. It was the Passover that they were to remember that Passover night when the Lord had passed over and they had been delivered. This seemingly is only the third time that they've kept the Passover. The first being the original Passover. The second being in the book of Numbers one year later that they kept the Passover. But all this time as they've wandered, they've allowed this to go undone. But now... As they enter into the promised land, it is of the utmost priority. Before they go and march around the walls, before those men would lead in that, before they face the enemy, there is the matter of consecration, there is the matter of cutting away, and now there is the matter of what? Remembrance. What are they to remember in the Passover? They are to remember how the Lord delivered them. They are to remember His power. They are to remember His mercy. They are to remember the blood that had been applied and how God brought them out. If you and I are to go forward in life, 
If we're to go forward in fruitfulness and victory for the Lord, we must be willing to allow the Lord to cut away and to remove in our life in a matter of consecration those acts and those thoughts of the flesh that hinder us, that prevent us from going forward. And there needs to be a continual remembrance of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. We do not go forward in our own flesh. We need to get our flesh out of the way. We go forward in remembrance of the Lamb and the blood that has been applied to our record, the blood that speaks on our behalf, the power that's in the blood. This is how we go forward. You may today be defeated, discouraged, distraught, and thinking what in the world is the sense in going on? Take your mind back to the Passover. Take your mind back to the blood that was applied. Take your mind back to the victory that God brought in your life. Recognize today that it's the Lord that saved you and it's the Lord that will help you to serve Him. So oftentimes we keep it and make it about self when we need to find our power and our strength in Christ. He is the one who brought them out. He is the one who brought them in and He is the one who will help us to have victory on a daily basis remembrance of this then I share with you one last thought and we'll wrap things up the Bible says in verse 11 and they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover unleavened cakes and parched corn in the self same day and the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land we're looking at steps or principles for victory in our Christian living number one we recognize the need for consecration number two we see the power in remembering who Christ is and what he's done for us and our position in him. And number three, we look to this business of new food. For all those years, they'd had manna. They had manna for breakfast. They had manna for lunch. They had manna for dinner. They had manna wraps. They had manna rolls. They had manna pancakes. They had manna pizza. Can you imagine being a child living in that time? When do we get to eat something different? I suspect it was tasted good. It's angel food. I, I don't know exactly what it tasted like. A light, maybe honey and something to it, but I think it was probably healthy and good for them. But let's face it, if you eat the same thing every day of your life, it could get old, right? But what was it? Every time they gathered that manna, that spoke to God's mercy, right? That God had not forsaken them, even though they were wandering, that God was meeting their needs. But now the Lord said, you're in a new place and I've got new food for you. And the Bible says they ate of the old corn. They were in a different season seemingly of harvest and there was leftover crop and they would take that leftover crop and from that they would prepare a meal. I bet corn never tasted so good. What do you think? You think corn, uh, what is it? We have cornbread. Can you imagine what they were having here when they were eating this? But then I want you to notice something else with all of that. And unleavened cakes, unleavened cakes. They are looking here, we're looking in the preparation leading up to battle. Seemingly it doesn't make sense that God would wound the very men who would go to battle. It seems like that would put them at a disadvantage. But no, when our hearts are consecrated, when our lives are as they should be, we're in a greater position for the Lord to be able to operate in our lives. So oftentimes when we are full of self, we're in a bad spot but when we're trusting in him. And so God took them to that place of cutting and then God told them to remember him and to remember his power. And then God said, I want you to eat something new. But with the new came the old, the unleavened bread. The unleavened bread, which was to be eaten and to be used. And even as we, when we take the Lord's Supper, we use unleavened bread. It speaks of that which is without corruption. When the Israelites were leaving Egypt, they grabbed their bread and hadn't had time to rise yet. And it was unleavened, it was flat. And from that, God said, I want you to always remember unleavened bread and the haste that I delivered you in. And I want you to recognize what leaven is. Leaven speaks a picture of sin. It's something that's added to another thing that stirs it and creates in that a process. And so this business of leaven being removed. Later on in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul would say that a little leaven leaveneth the lump, speaking of sin, and just a little bit causing problems. God wanted them to see in their life as they were going forward the priority and the importance of keeping sin out. The need for that. As Israelites would prepare for Passover, and even now, they'll spend several days leading up to that, searching their house, looking for anything with leaven in it. 
There are five grains that they remove from their household and different baking products that they would remove that have that property of acting like a leaven in something. There's a special event they'll actually do before the Passover, the entire family will go through and search and look high and low to make sure in their home that there's no leaven. That's a picture. It's a picture of looking into our lives and having wrong and sin and those things that would hurt us and hinder us from serving the Lord, having those things taken out of our life. If we're going to face the enemy before we sharpen our swords, before we march, it's good for us to do personal work or to allow the Lord to do personal work in our life. That speaks to what? It speaks of consecration. It speaks to remembrance. And it speaks to cleanliness or proper living. Going to the unleavened bread and eating that and removing the leaven from our life. It also speaks to the Word of God and the need for the Word of God. That bread, that clean bread, that pure bread, the bread without sin, Jesus, the bread of life, and then the Word of God. I really believe, and I'm done, that the Lord has great things for our lives. I believe that there are relationships to be restored. I believe that there's fruitfulness. I believe there are souls to be won, that there are works to be built, that there are missions to help. I truly believe that. I believe that God wants for you fullness of joy. I cannot guarantee you that this next year will be without sorrow. I can almost guarantee you that it will because this is what we have in life. I can't guarantee you that there won't be problems because consistently I see that we have our problems. But I can and I do believe that the Lord who is with Joshua is with us. And as the Lord gave them a parting of the Jordan, an establishment of his mighty work in their life, he desires to do the same for us. Would I, could I ask you here for just a moment, would you search your heart? Would you allow the Holy Spirit of God to do surgery and cut away those things that ought to be cut away? Would you remember the Lord and who he is and what he's done in his power? Would you recognize that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, as we've used consistently throughout this study? And then would you recognize this business of unleavened bread, keeping things consistently clean and feasting on that which is clean, the word of God? Let's pray. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for this time that we could spend in the word of God. We trust God that you would have something for us from this. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Could I ask this question this morning? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? If you're here this morning and you say, Preacher, I know what that means to be saved. I know that I'm saved. I've believed on Christ as my Savior. I know that. May I rejoice with you today? Would you raise your hand? You say, Preacher, I know the Lord Jesus Christ is my Savior. I know that I'm saved. Would you raise your hand? We rejoice in that. We remember the Lord in that. Friend, if you were not able to raise your hand, we want you so, so much so to know Christ. If you're here today and you did not raise your hand, maybe you have questions. Maybe you don't know. You don't have understanding in that. I understand that. There was a time in all of our lives where we too needed someone to help us. There was a man who was even looking. He was searching. He was reading a prophet. And the preacher was sent to him and asked him, do you understand what you read? And he said, how can I except a man show me? The Bible says, how can they hear without a preacher? We're here today to lift up Christ, but we're also here today to help you to know Jesus as your Savior. If you're here this morning and say, Preacher, I don't know for sure that I'm saved. Please pray for me. I don't know that. I don't have understanding of that. Nobody's ever helped me to know that, and, but I don't know for sure that I'm saved. You say, Preacher, please pray for me. I don't know that I'm saved. Would you raise your hand this morning and say, Preacher, please pray for me. I don't know that I'm saved. I'd like to. I'd like to know more about that. Could I pray for you? Who else would say this morning, Preacher, I'm not sure that I'm saved. I hope today if you raised your hand or you did not raise your hand, if you're here and you do not know Christ as your Savior, well, if I could, I'd come to you individually. But here in just a moment when we have an invitation, would you let somebody around you, would you come forward and let somebody show you and guide you in the Scripture? Would you take my hand this morning in the lobby and say, Preacher, I want to know Jesus as my Savior? Let us help you in that. If you're here this morning and say, Preacher, I'm saved, but there was something in the message today involving consecration, involving remembrance, Involving that business of the unleavened bread. There was something in that message for me as a believer today. 
and the Lord is working in my life, you'd say, preacher, please pray for me. Would you lift your hand? Anybody like that today? Preacher, there was something in there for me. God bless you. Many hands. I trust today as the Lord does this work in our hearts that we'll respond to him. Could we for just a few moments have an invitation? I'll ask the penis to play. We'll stand to our feet. Perhaps you're praying for somebody or something, or perhaps this morning you do not know Christ, but you'd like to. Would you come today and let someone help you with that? Let's stand to our feet, please. Our heads are bowed. We're asking the penis to play at this time. You step out for the Lord. Decision, perhaps, or situation. Perhaps today you'd like to know more about salvation. We encourage you today to come. 